Welcome to a journey through time and mystery as we unravel the enigma of Atlantis and the deities of antiquity. In this video, we will delve into the depths of history, combining myths, legends, and philosophy to unveil the hidden truths about Atlantis. Join us as we explore the remarkable lecture of M. Pierre Termier and Plato's writings, revealing a story that combines history and allegory to convey profound wisdom. Before we dive into the intriguing details, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and turn on notifications, so you never miss an episode. Now, let's embark on this epic journey through time, as we uncover the legacy of Atlantis and the wisdom it left behind. Atlantis and the Deities of Antiquity In the 33rd page of historical records lies the captivating tale of Atlantis. This article graces the annual report of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution for the year concluding on June 30, 1915. The author of this enlightening piece is none other than M. Pierre Termier, a distinguished member of the Academy of Sciences and Director of Service of the Geologic Chart of France. It is in the words of M. Termier that we embark on a journey into the Atlantean hypothesis, originally presented in a lecture before the Institut Oceanographique in 1912. What we are about to explore are the translated notes of this remarkable lecture, published within the hallowed pages of the Smithsonian Report. M. Termier's eloquent pen captures the revival of scientific interest in Atlantis after a prolonged period of neglect. He marvels at how the realms of naturalists, geologists, zoologists, and botanists are now contemplating whether Plato, in a fragment of mankind's history, has imparted an account not far from reality. We stand on the precipice of discovery, affirmation is withheld, but evidence grows for the existence of a vast continental expanse or a collection of grand islands that once thrived west of the Pillars of Hercules, the legendary Strait of Gibraltar. And thus, the question of Atlantis is rekindled for the scholars of the world. It is in the depths of oceanography, the study of the ocean's mysteries, that M. Termier believes we may find the keys to unlock this enigma. In this temple of maritime science, he invites oceanographers to join the quest, along with those who, amid the urban clamor, still heed the distant murmur of the sea. M. Termier, in his lecture, delves into the geologic, geographic, and zoologic data, which provide sustenance to the Atlantis theory. He metaphorically drains the vast bed of the Atlantic Ocean, pondering the undulations of its basin. He references locations from the Azores to Iceland, where dredging has retrieved lava from unfathomable depths of 3,000 meters. The presence of volcanic islands in the Atlantic corroborates Plato's assertion that the Atlantean continent met its demise through cataclysmic volcanic eruptions. Furthermore, M. Termier presents the findings of a young French zoologist, M. Louis Germain, who acknowledged the existence of an Atlantic landmass connected to the Iberian Peninsula, Mauritania, and extending into arid regions. The lecture concludes with a vivid depiction of the continent's submersion. Now, let us synopsize Plato's description of the Atlantean civilization. In antiquity, gods divided the earth amongst themselves, apportioning lands in accordance with their divine status. Each deity became the guardian of their domain, constructing temples, appointing priesthoods, and instituting systems of sacrifice. Poseidon's realm included the sea and the island continent of Atlantis. At the heart of the island stood a mountain, the abode of three earth-born primordial beings, Evanor, Lucipi, and their sole daughter, Cleto. Cleto's exceptional beauty attracted Poseidon, who fathered ten sets of male offspring with her. Poseidon divided his dominion among these ten, appointing Atlas, the eldest, as their overlord. The entire land came to be known as Atlantis, and the surrounding sea, the Atlantic, in honor of Atlas. Prior to the birth of his ten sons, Poseidon partitioned the continent and its coastal waters into concentric zones of land and water, crafted with geometric precision. Two land zones and three water zones encircled the central island, which Poseidon irrigated with two springs, one warm and the other cold. The descendants of Atlas reigned over Atlantis with sagacity and industry, elevating the land to unparalleled greatness. The natural riches of Atlantis seemed boundless, featuring mines of precious metals, tamed wildlife, and fragrant flower gardens from which perfumes were distilled. Amidst this abundance, the Atlanteans constructed grand palaces, temples, and harbors. They bridged the sea zones and later carved a profound canal connecting the outer ocean with the central island. Here, in the city of the Golden Gates, resided the palaces and temples of Poseidon, surpassing all others in their grandeur. The Atlanteans wove a complex network of bridges and canals, uniting the various regions of their kingdom. 
Plato's account further details the quarrying of white, black, and red stones from beneath Atlantis for the construction of public edifices and docks. Walls encircled each land zone, with the outer wall sheathed in brass, the middle in tin, and the innermost, encompassing the citadel, in Orichalcum. At the heart of the central island, within a wall of gold, lay a sanctuary dedicated to Cleto and Poseidon. Here, the first ten rulers of the island were born, and each year, their descendants offered tribute. Poseidon's own temple, clad in silver and gold, stood within the citadel. Its interior shimmered with ivory, gold, silver, and orichalcum, even to the pillars and floors. Inside the temple, a colossal statue of Poseidon stood, holding the reins of a chariot drawn by six-winged horses, with a retinue of a hundred nereids riding on dolphins. Golden statues of the first ten kings and their consorts graced the exterior of the building. The island was adorned with groves and gardens, where both hot and cold springs flowed. Temples dedicated to various deities, arenas for physical activities, public baths, and a grand horse racing course contributed to the cultural tapestry. Fortifications dotted strategic locations across the land zones, and the Great Harbor welcomed ships from diverse maritime nations. The regions of Atlantis teemed with inhabitants, and the sound of human voices filled the air. The part of Atlantis facing the sea rose precipitously, while the central city was nestled within a fertile plain, sheltered by towering mountains renowned for their grandeur. The plain yielded two harvests annually, with winter rains and extensive irrigation canals sustaining crops. The plain was divided into sections, with each district contributing warriors and chariots in times of conflict. The ten governing kings of Atlantis varied in the specifics of their military organization. Each king possessed full sovereignty over his realm, yet they pledged mutual support in times of attack. Matters of great importance and warfare rested in the hands of the direct descendants of Atlas. No king had the authority to decree life or death for his kin without the consent of the majority of the ten. Plato closes the narrative with a revelation that it was this mighty empire that eventually waged war on the Hellenic states. This, however, transpired only after the rulers of Atlantis, intoxicated by power and ambition, decided to subjugate the entire world. In their wickedness, the Atlantean kings drew the ire of Zeus, who convened the gods to address their transgressions. Alas, Plato's account leaves us hanging, for the Critias remains unfinished. In the Timaeus, an Egyptian priest shares further insights into Atlantis, narrating its eventual downfall. But afterwards there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of rain all your warlike men and a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared, and was sunk beneath the sea. And that is the reason why the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is such a quantity of shallow mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. The introduction to Thomas Taylor's translation of the Timaeus quotes from Marcellus' History of Ethiopia, noting the existence of seven sacred islands in the Atlantic Ocean, alongside three other vast isles, one dedicated to Pluto, one to Ammon, and the central one, a thousand stadia in diameter, to Neptune. Crantor, in his commentary on Plato, asserted that the story of Atlantis was inscribed on pillars, which survived until approximately 300 BC. These references bear testament to the enigmatic legacy of Atlantis. Upon scrutinizing Plato's account, it becomes evident that the story combines both historical and allegorical elements. Visionaries such as Origen, Porphyry, Proclus, Iamblichus, and Syrianus realized that the tale concealed profound philosophical mysteries but remained divided on its precise interpretation. Atlantis, therefore, embodies the tripartite essence of the universe and the human body. The ten kings of Atlantis symbolize the tetractes, the numbers, which manifest as five pairs of contrasting forces. These numbers, spanning from one to ten, govern all existence, and the monad, the one, the eldest among them, oversees them. Armed with Poseidon's trident scepter, these kings reigned over the seven small and three grand islands constituting Atlantis. From a philosophical perspective, these ten islands represent the threefold attributes of the supreme deity and the seven celestial regents who bow before the eternal throne. Should we consider Atlantis as the archetype of the cosmos, its submersion signifies the descent of organized, rational consciousness into the realm of transient ignorance and irrationality. Both the sinking of Atlantis and the biblical story of the fall of man symbolize spiritual involution, a prerequisite to conscious evolution. The initiated Plato employed the Atlantis allegory for dual purposes, uniting profound philosophical truths with historical narratives. 
it is plausible that the accounts preserved by Egyptian priests were amended to safeguard the sacred doctrine. This, however, does not imply that Atlantis is purely mythological. The fantastical elements surrounding Atlantis, its origin, size, appearance, and its purported destruction in 9600 BC challenge our comprehension. Within the central island of Atlantis, a towering mountain cast a shadow extending 5,000 stadia, with its peak touching the sphere of the ether. This mountain symbolized the world's axle and held deep significance for numerous cultures, representing the human head emerging from the four elemental components of the body. This sacred mountain, upon whose summit stood the Temple of the Gods, gave birth to the stories of Olympus, Meru, and Asgard. The city of the Golden Gates, the capital of Atlantis, endures in various religions as the city of the gods or the holy city, with streets paved in gold and twelve gates adorned with precious stones. The Atlantis narrative reveals a pivotal mystery, the culmination of divine wisdom and sacred symbols passed down through the ages. Sun worship, a legacy of the Atlanteans, permeates the rituals and ceremonies of both Christianity and paganism. The cross and the serpent, emblematic of divine wisdom, hold their origins in Atlantis. The Mayan and Quiche traditions revere the deity Quetzalcoatl, also known as Kukul Khan, who emerged from the waters to guide humanity in the ways of civilization. Their tales mirror the Hindu story of Vaiswasvata, who embarked on a raft of serpents to escape divine wrath. Horses, believed to be first domesticated by the Atlanteans, are deeply intertwined with the Atlantean legacy. From Atlantis, the world inherited not only arts, sciences, and philosophies but also the legacy of conflict, enmity, and distortion. Atlantis bore witness to the genesis of warfare, and subsequent conflicts often sought to rectify the initial discord. Before Atlantis submerged into the depths, enlightened initiates who comprehended their land's impending doom withdrew, carrying with them the sacred and hidden teachings. These Atlantean exiles settled in Egypt, becoming its first divine rulers. Cosmological myths underpinning the world's sacred texts find their roots in the rituals of Atlantis. As we contemplate the past, we ponder whether the wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual insight possessed by the Atlantean priestly caste were passed down through the ages. The myths of gods emerging from the sea and imparting wisdom are found in numerous cultures. This cherished tradition could well be a testament to the legacy of the Atlantean priests. All that remains in the collective memory of primitive man are gleaming golden artifacts, profound wisdom, and the sanctity of their symbols, the serpent and the cross. The ships in which they arrived have faded into obscurity, for to unlearned minds, boats seemed otherworldly. Wherever the Atlanteans journeyed, they constructed pyramids and temples in homage to the Grand Sanctuary in the city of the Golden Gates. These ancient structures persist in the pyramids of Egypt, Mexico, and Central America. Mounds in Normandy, Britain, and among the American Indians preserve the remnants of this shared culture. Amidst their endeavor of global expansion, Atlantis met its demise, engulfed by cataclysmic forces. The initiate priests of the Sacred Feather, who had promised to return to their missionary settlements, never did. Over centuries, only fantastical tales remained of divine beings emerging from a realm now submerged beneath the sea. H. P. Blavatsky offers a profound perspective on the causes behind the Atlantean catastrophe. She explains how the Atlantean race, under the sinister influence of the Vetat, evolved into a nation of malevolent magicians. In response, a devastating war erupted, which forms the basis of the tales of the race of Cain, the giants, and the story of Noah and his virtuous kin. The conflict culminated in the submersion of Atlantis, echoing the Babylonian and Biblical floods. In this context, the giants and magicians met their end, except for a few, such as Shsuthras and Noah, whose tales are akin to the Hindu Noah, Vaiswasvata. This grand narrative redefines our understanding of history and spirituality. It beckons us to contemplate the profound legacy of Atlantis, a civilization that bequeathed not only the material riches but also the sacred wisdom of the ages to our world. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of Atlantis and the deities of antiquity. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue uncovering the mysteries of history and philosophy, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. If you have your own thoughts on Atlantis or if you'd like us to explore more topics, please let us know in the comments below. Stay tuned for more exciting journeys through time and wisdom on this channel. Until then, remember that the past holds secrets that can illuminate our future.